Amjerat Maxu Atevit Arad Gino Chani Shem Degi Mamusana Belli, Romelit Kahlaut Chani Auditoris Twist Argat Snobili, American Historic Ose, Ronald Suni. Is Kahlaut Michigan University is Professor, Politics is Metsnia Rebista, Historis Mimartulebit, the Asave Chicago University is Historista, Politics is Metsnia Rebis, Emeritus Professor. Akuarnish Naurum Professor is Suni O Actiura Chartuli. Ilya Sakhamtsipo Universitetis Tanamedrove Sakartolos Istori Samagistro Programashi. Misi Arati Publicatia, Rogots Bolo Ramdenime, Atzleulis Manzuze Gamoitsa, Romelitz Gamoitsa, Ezuneba, Sabjata Kaushiris, Samhret Kaukasis, Halhebis Historias. Masak Nashrome Bizarian Celi Chamonatwali, Tumsa Am Shesawal Shivaksan and Polot Earth, Matkans, Esaris Dravandeli Forumis Twis. The training context is to be relevant to him. Obligations, igni, cartelis, chamuk alibeba, es nashromi pirula that has crossed Mosdar Vats as Gamboitsa, Yop Irveli, English Surenazi Gamutsemuli, Nashromi, the Gamukleva, Zalian Sapuzliani, the Nishnovani, Sakatolos, Historic Shesahep. Ama ve Gamuklevis Meore Gamutsema Gamoitsa at the Strasot Mosdar Totmetzels. The cartoon it will list with Eurias Ozdaur Cells, Meoregamotsema Itargna, Heinrich Berlis, Pontis, Tbilisis Opisis Pradajer. Professor is Sunni, Sakatolos, Tanamedrove, Historis, Gamoklevis, Ahali, Midgomebis, Ganutarebisas, Guibitskeps, Sakatolos, Gamurcheula, Saint Tereso, Dam Didaritz Arsulis, Dam Didari Historiographiuli Traditis, Complex Urobis, Shest Aulisken, Rat Shesas Levlovas, Moksems, Satanado Davinahot. The Sheva Pasot is to Ragavlena Iconia nationalism, Ots Sabjota Quernebzerodesats, nationalist or project Ebim, Knidnen, Zarsolis Edgar, Romantizabul, Sterilur, Idealizabul Historias, the Guet Solidnen, Amistoris, Rtul, the Zogger, Pnel Momentabs. Drevan del Mosenebashi, um, Professor Sunit, Arsolidan, Magalitabis Mohmovic, Steba or Adreba Gamahulos, Cartuli, Ronulim and Quidrobis in Arde Gobriu. Gaz Rebasa de Momolis, Zarmosahuase. The Quelotoba, Dalian Saint Ereso Moxeneba, Dahlobet Ormuts Gastans, the Shemte Gokimba, it Hobis does Mishas at Levoba. So, Didit Matloba, I'm very happy to be here in Tbilisi, even though I'm far away. It's always a pleasure. And I'm looking forward to coming to Georgia in uh, July of next year with a bunch of students. So, maybe some of us will meet together uh, then. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be in Georgia because Georgia is such a vibrant, uh, exciting, always interesting, confusing, conflicted place, but it's never boring. It's always interesting. And I have never regretted that years and years ago, 35 years ago or more, I decided to write a modern history of Georgia, and I had the temerity the boldness to call it the making of the Georgian nation. At the time, one very nationalistic critic uh, criticized the book as mistitled. How could this be a book about the making of the Georgian nation when it surely should have been about ancient history, not primarily about the 19th and 20th century? I think that reader misunderstood what I was trying to do. I was trying precisely to think through how a particularly modern form of political community, namely the nation, emerged in the last 200 years in Georgia. If nationalists require that the pedigree of a nation extend back into the primeval ooze out of which the first humans ascended, scholars might be more attentive to the discontinuities of a people's history. In other words, I wanted to talk about the ruptures, the displacements, the conflicts that make a smooth story of the rise or rebirth of a nation very difficult to construct. How did I discover this view? Well, when I came first to the University of Michigan way back in 1981, 
I was supposed to teach a survey course, a history course about Armenia. And I found myself putting together pieces of a puzzle to try to make a coherent narrative. But those pieces did not fit well. For I found out that rupture, discontinuity, was as frequent in that history as continuity, maybe even more so. In other words, telling national history, I realized, is always an act of selection and of suppression. It's a fabrication of a kind of national myth. And this practice of creating a national story that was continuous and fluent and without rupture in the face of what I think history ought to be, that is a critical, but hopefully persuasive narrative of the past, a narrative as truthful a telling of a tale as is humanly possible. So I had I was confused about what to do. But I think history need not be told only as a glorious rise to exclusive ethnicity or nationality, as it often is told in the Caucasus. And by the way, here in the United States as well, I find particularly from more conservative forces. There should be in our sense of history also a telling of what has been lost and what has been forgotten as well. Now, I was born in the United States, as had my Armenian mother. But my father had emigrated as a child from Tbilisi, then known in the, to the world in its Russian name, Tiflis. At the dinner table, my dad would rega regale to me and to my sister stories of his childhood in that city in Sololaki, on what was called then Bebetovskaya Ulitsa, Adamiani today. At the dinner table, uh, he told us about the difficult years of war and revolution, of the Menshevik Republic, the invasion of the Bolsheviks. So I, as a small child, became very, very interested in this faraway place and when I became a historian, I tried to learn the languages of that region. First Russian, then Armenian. I learned Armenian as a foreign language because my parents spoke to us only in English because they wanted to make us as American as possible. And then I learned Georgian. And in the 1970s, I could read Georgian rather well and even speak it pretty good. And eventually, I even now am working on Turkish. My father and his father, who was an ethnomusicologist, Greek or Sunni, were very pro-Soviet. They were hopeful that socialism would create a better, more egalitarian world. Well, as they say in Russian, Nipoluchilis. It didn't happen. Almost everywhere, capitalism has survived, sometimes in democratic forms and sometimes in more authoritarian. Empires fell, among them the Soviet Union. Nationalism flourished in the new states that emerged from under the debris of imperial collapse. Capitalism nationalism, ethnic and religious conflict, democracy, authoritarianism, they seem to be the relevant choices of our world. More recently, in fact, our world has been plagued by vicious conflicts between nation states, 
ethnic cleansing by Azerbaijan of Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, a war of aggression by Russia against Ukraine, and now as we sit here, Israeli bombing of trapped Palestinians in Gaza and merciless killing of Palestinians in the West Bank. When I was young in the 1960s, I would not have thought such a world would still exist. I was very naive. I was very utopian. I thought that there would be more dem democracy, maybe some kinds of socialism, greater internationalism. These views now seem to be utopian. We live today in what can be called a one-dimensional world, a world that seems to be no longer having any alternatives. And for the time being, at least, we have to learn to live with that world, while at the same time imagining what a different future might be. History gives us the possibility, as does anthropology, of imagining other ways of organizing life, as people in the past did and people outside of Western civilization did. So let me talk about that. And what I want to do then is talk about how nations and nationalism were created, particularly in Georgia, how I understand nation, and whether there are ways we can grow perhaps not outside of nation, but better forms of nation, better ways of thinking about nation. Whatever language and ideas were used by ancient and medieval people to understand the societies in which they lived, these ideas were different from the kinds of understandings, the discourses in which today we speak about nations. In my understanding, and here's my definition of nation, which is about the modern nation, nations are those political communities made up of people who believe that they share characteristics, perhaps their origins or values or historical experiences or language, territory, or any of many other elements. And on the basis of those shared characteristics, we'll call that culture, that gives them the right to self-determination, ruling themselves, perhaps a little control of a piece of the world's real estate, their homeland, Samshoblo, even statehood and the benefits that follow. Now that understanding of nation is a modern one. It means that culture gives you the right to political self-rule. That's so different from the way people thought of political communities in the past that were about conquest by someone or royal authority that came from above, from God. Modern nations, exist within a discourse of the nation that holds that the only source of legitimacy for state authorities is that they somehow represent that nation. And they rule with some kind of assent by the people. In other words, implied in the modern concept of nation is some notion of popular sovereignty, and even the additional notion that each nation, however constituted, should have its own state, and that in all but the most anomalous cases, each state should have within it a single nation. Now, if you think about that, that every nation should have a state, and every state should have a single nation, you are proposing a very powerful 
but ultimately a destructive utopian idea, which is the basis of much of modern politics and much of the conflict in the 20th and now 21st century. This conflict, as in the Caucasus and in Georgia, has been precisely about the fact that nation and state don't fit together. It's difficult to get the architecture right, to fit peoples of different nations into these bounded states. Here, at some level, is the basic problem with Georgia and Abkhazia, Georgia and South Ossetia, maybe even with Georgia and Jachati and Marnauli. Here's the problem that Armenians are suffering now with Nagorno-Karabakh, now triumphantly in the hands of Azerbaijan, which managed quickly to expel 100,000 or more people from a land in which they had lived for thousands of years. Azerbaijan wants to get the architecture right and committed war crimes and crimes against humanity in order to achieve that. That's the nature of the nation and the nature of politics in our time. In one sense, the problems of the Caucasus can be seen as arising from the collapse of empire. In the case of Georgia and Armenia and Azerbaijan, the collapse of the Tsarist and then the Soviet empires. And after the collapse of those empires, the attempts to build ethno-national, relatively homogeneous nation states in a post imperial setting. I would even argue that the current war in Ukraine is the continuation of the unraveling of the Soviet empire, trying to figure out where Russia stops and Ukraine begins. Think about what these empires were like. Empires are very different from nation states. Empires in general do not acquire their legitimacy from the people. People obey empires, not because they've agreed to them or to be governed by them, not because of a neat match of language, culture, and statehood as in nation states. Empires are built on the right of conquest or the right of dynastic inheritance. My father ruled here, now I rule here. Something, by the way, like Azerbaijan, it seems. Or election by an elite or divine sanction. God gave me the right to rule here. In empires, to their credit, many cultures exist and are even tolerated. They often live together. They move around, some dominating the cities, uh, as Armenians did in Tiflis in the middle of the 19th century. Or, by the way, as Muslims did at the turn of the 20th century in Yerevan. Imagine that. Yerevan was largely a Muslim city uh, in, in around 1900. Armenians don't like to remember that. But... You know, some villages might be one nationality, the countryside might be one nationality, the towns might be another. Empires were characterized by mobility, by shared cultures, by uh, people managing to tolerate difference in a way that has become more different and more difficult in nation states. You could have a kind of imperial patriotism in Tsarist times or the Soviet Union, that is loyalty to a state like the Russian Tsarist state or the Soviet Union, that managed to coexist with ethnic and religious loyalties and affiliations. 
In other words, Georgians, Armenians, and Azerbaijanis could be loyal to their nation, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, while at the same time, they fought and died with other peoples of the USSR against fascism in World War II. It was the Soviet people made up of different nationalities that defeated Hitlerism and not only saved the Soviet Union, but also saved the world for capitalism and democracy in the West. And Georgians, Armenians, Ukrainians, Russians, and Azerbaijanis can be proud of that sacrifice and that achievement, even though it has now been tainted and undermined by Putin's unprovoked aggressive war in Ukraine. As a historian, I tend to look backwards to understand the present and perhaps might what, what might lie in the future. I see the past as another country where they did things differently. And right now I'm going to turn to the history of Georgia and show and try to show and remind you because you probably know your Georgian history better than I do. I'm going to try to show how differently Georgians in different periods thought about who they were and understand their national identity in different ways. Now, you certainly will make few friends in Tbilisi if you try to argue, as I, as I have, that quite long-lived nations like Georgia or Armenia have constructed and changing identities that can be traced, or that discursive peculiarities of earlier identities have been reinterpreted reinterpreted in the frame of later models, frames, templates, particularly that of the nation. You won't make friends if you see a discontinuous and varied history that has been simplified, reduced into a story of a relatively fixed nation moving continuously through time, struggling to re realize itself in full nationhood and eventually independent statehood in our own times. One of my former graduate students, now a professor in Texas, Dr. Stephen Rapp, completed a dissertation in history here at the University of Michigan some few decades ago. And he showed in very careful reading of medieval and later Georgian chronically, chronicles that at least three major phases of Georgian historiographical writing can be illuminated. There was a pre-Bagratid period uh, before 800 AD. There was the high medieval period of the Bagratids. And then there was an 18th century reworking of the Georgian historical tradition by Vakhtushi and the king, Vakhtang VI. If you look at the translation of the Georgian Chronicles into English by Robert W. Thompson, you can find an easily accessible confirmation of these very interesting points made by Stephen Rapp. So what's the argument there? What he found by reading carefully in a non-nationalist way the medieval chronicles of Georgia, Kartlis Tkovreba, is the closeness of the major Christian communities in the Caucasus in the early period. Though the relations of Georgians and Armenians were not consistently marked by friendliness, nor were they marked by perpetual hostility. Relations between Muslims and Georgians also were complex and changing. These peoples live together in a complicated symbiosis that involved interrelations, conflict, intermarriage, blending of cultures at various levels, borrowings from one another, trade, dynastic infighting, 
cross-ethnic alliances, migration, and fluctuating, fluctuating frontiers. In other words, they were living in kinds of empires in which mixing of peoples was more common than distinct distinctions between peoples. If empires are about mixing of peoples, nations in the modern period have become about the unmixing of peoples. Eventually, Georgians would distinguish themselves from Armenians, but in the earliest Christian period, they coexisted in a single Christian community. Only in the sixth century did the Kartvelian Eastern Georgian Church free itself of Armenian dominance and identify with the Greek Orthodox Church of Byzantium. And later, the Georgian kingdoms of Tavid Akhmashenebeli and Tamar Mepe were formed as multinational, multi-religious, multicultural polities. In other words, those kingdoms of Tavid and Tamar were more like empires than like modern nation states. Still, in the early sources, the common ancestry of Armenians and Georgians was constantly referred to. In Kartlistkovraba, roughly about 800 AD, all the major Caucasian peoples have a single forefather, Togarma or Togamos, a descendant of Noah. Moreover, Togamar's first son was Haos or Haik, the eponymous founder of the Armenians, who in the Chronicles is the elder son superior to his younger brother, Kartlos, the founder of the Georgians. As Stephen Rapp puts it, quote, our circa 800 Georgian historian was no nationalist. And he faithfully retransmitted the received Armenian traditions, though reworking them for a Kartvelian audience, unquote. Haos, or Haik, slew Nimrod and thus, liber and thus liberated his own and his brother's peoples. The Chronicles also claim that Georgians spoke Armenian before the mythical invasion of Alexander the Great and only then created Enakartuli, the Georgian language. In these early sources, Kartvelian identity is related to the Georgian language, which displaced all others, and to the particular religion embraced by the king. First it was paganism, and then it was Christianity. And the developing historical tradition that these writers, these chroniclers, were putting down on parchment. In the earliest histories, descent from the first heroes of human history gave the kings their aura. Parnavas, the purported first Georgian king, gains authority by creating, according to the early chronicles, the Georgian alphabet and commanding the whole country to speak Georgian. Parnavas's apparently Persian origins are of no particular concern to these early Georgian writers. But note that the ancient Kartvelian identity and the boundaries of that society do not match exactly subsequent identities and boundaries. For one, many parts of present-day Georgia, not to mention other areas that Georgian nationalists might like to claim, were not included in that earlier Kartli. Later in the Bagratid period, another source of authority and legitimacy became more important. Here the king is sanctioned by a unique genealogy. It's not descent from the first Georgian heroes or even the earlier Georgian dynasties, but rather a rather bold Bagratid claim shared by the Armenian Bagratids that the family was descendant from no one less than the biblical king David of Israel. <laughs> 
In the Bagratid state, identity was wrapped around religion, and these kings sought to unite all Orthodox Georgians under a single state authority. And indeed, the Georgian Bagratids established the autocephaly of the Georgian church, and then argued that that religious independence had existed since the church's foundation by the apostle Andrew and Simon the Zealot. So over time, the Georgian Bagratids distanced themselves from their Armenian cousins, obscured their common ancestry, and emphasized instead Georgian uniqueness. Georgia, like Armenia, in my view, was a nation made within empires, the Tsarist Empire and later the Soviet Empire. Georgia was ruled for over a hundred years by the Russians and under those Russians was unified under a single state power, the Russian Empire. And processes of modernization and greater social communication brought isolated villagers into closer contact with their fellow Georgians, as well as non-Georgians, in the towns and markets of the newly capitalist economy. The Russian-educated Georgian intelligentsia borrowed ideas of nationalism with its claims uh, to autonomy, self-determination, even statehood from the North and the West. A sense of nation in the modern idea of nation grew and spread from the top of society downward. In Georgia, for complex reasons, that sense of nation was articulated by nationalists first, and then later changed and was led by a political movement of Marxist social democrats. In other words, there was no inevitability that there would be a particular form of nationalism, no matter how old the ethno-political community in Georgia was. And it would take a brief period of independent statehood from 1918 to 1921, and then 70 years of Soviet power within the framework of a Soviet Georgian Republic, 1921 to 1991, before a virulent form of ethno-nationalism would triumph in Georgia. And what would its effects be? It would tear that new nation apart. And Georgia is still recovering from the events of the end of the Soviet Union. What is clear reading through the Georgian texts is that there are a number of competing ideas of Georgian identity available from the past. Earlier traditions were reworked and reconceived in a nationalist mode. There were some traditions that were suppressed, silenced, though they might be still available for those who looked for them. And some of those traditions are in many ways more appropriate and more useful for the multinational conditions of the modern world. But you can't escape history. You can't escape the 19th century or the 20th century. In many ways, you can't escape the Soviet period. Because in the 19th century, as Georgia became more and more a modern nation, as it connected villages to towns, railroads, greater social communication, certain ideas developed that separated Georgians from non-Georgians. Armenians, who existed in many of the cities, were seen as an alien force, a bourgeoisie uh, who was exploiting uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Georgian workers. Russians, of course, were the rulers, the officialdom, and they too could be seen as enemies. Non-Georgian elements who had lived in the country for thousands of years could now be seen as foreigners or 
more generously, Stumrebi, guests who had been invited into Georgia by a generous and magnanimous people, but whom presumably could be at any time asked to leave. So Georgia then emerges in the 19th and 20th century as a multinational state with a more coherent core of Georgian ethnic nationhood. And this becomes even more extreme in the Soviet period. Oddly, the Soviet Union, for all its repressiveness and all of its limitation on the expression of nationalism, actually allowed the growth and the greater cohesion and coherence of a national Georgian statehood and national Georgian culture, uh, even though that becomes more difficult to imagine. What I want to emphasize is that between the nationalists of the 19th century, people like Ilya Chapchavadze or Akaki Tseretelli, and the Soviet period, there was this very interesting moment, this experiment in trying another form of Georgian nationality. That is a Marxist social democratic, turns out Menshevik, not Bolshevik, uh, idea of nationhood. The Georgian Mensheviks, who have been largely forgotten uh, in the present day, though there are now revivals among some critics uh, and, and scholars of this tradition, the Georgian Mensheviks are an amazing group of intellectuals, largely coming from Western Georgia, led by a very impressive person, Noya Jordania, who managed not only to recreate the idea of Georgian nationhood, but also to create a republic, an independent republic that lasted for about three years. Noya Jordania's formulation of nationhood was that Georgians exist as a nation, but we're not against Armenians as Armenians. We are opposed to the bourgeoisie and to capitalism. We're not opposed to Russians as ethnic Russians. We're opposed to autocracy as represented by the czarist government. And there was an effort, a very successful effort, to form uh, for a few years a democratic socialist republic, more democratic than socialist, I might say, uh, that existed in Georgia. But even though this republic was viable, and could have existed in a more tolerant neighborhood, it was destroyed by the Bolsheviks. Indeed, it was destroyed by two Georgian Bolsheviks, primarily uh, Sergo Ojenikidze and, of course, uh, Joseph Stalin, most particularly. And yet, after the destruction, violent destruction, of the Menshevik Republic and crushing in 1924 of an insurrection by those same Mensheviks, Georgia, despite all of the trauma and all the difficulties it suffered under the Soviets, think of the great purges of Stalin, think of the murder of important Georgian intellectuals, etc. Nevertheless, through that 70 years, Georgia as a nation became more self-conscious more national, more coherent, and more prepared to become an independent state, nation state of its own. Here's the great irony of the Soviet empire. Empires think they have a mission civilisatrice, a, a, a civilizing mission, that they're going to raise these peasants up and make them coherent, well-educated, uh, mobile, uh, literate people. And then uh, you won't need the empire anymore. In many ways, the Soviet empire was successful in making nation states, at least 15 of them, if not more, within the body of the Soviet empire. And by 1991, 
that empire, that Soviet empire was superfluous. It could be gotten rid of uh, and independent states were indeed formed. But there was also another legacy of the Soviet period. That is, they had formed exclusive nationalisms as well. And when Georgia became independent, as you all know, uh, and your parents know better than I know, uh, it broke up into uh, a fiercely nationalist republic under uh, Zviad Gamsa Kurdia and the rebellion in Abkhazia and South Ossetia against this virulent form of Georgian nationalism. So Georgia cannot escape its history. It exists as a product of Tsarist and Soviet empires, and it has to deal now with those legacies. But as I'm trying to argue, it also has very positive traditions of the past. It, it was and was successful as a multicultural society. There was pride in the 19th and early 20th century that Tbilisi was a cosmopolitan city in which different nationalities lived together. Who were those Kintos, Kintebi, Kintebi anyway? Are they Armenians? Are they Georgians? They're Caucasians. They're Caucasians. And Cauc the Caucasia had been a place of mixed culture where people knew how to live together. It's difficult today to imagine other ways of making nation. And yet Georgians have traditions of social coherence, of socialism, of democracy, uh, of cosmopolitanism, of internationalism that can be resurrected and create a new kind of Georgia, one that fits best its own self image of a generous, magnanimous people who indeed not only invite guests to come live with them, but also understand that they are part of the fabric of the nation. They are going to live and thrive and suffer and die together with Georgians. That's the image that I take from history. That's what gives me hope and optimism in the future of our little republic. I indeed, as a grandson of Sololaki, still feel as if somewhere deep down, I too am a Tiflis Eli, Didid Matloba.